Turbulence intensity is a really useful quantity for presenting the results of RAND's CFD calculations. Unfortunately, there's quite a bit of confusion around the definition of turbulence intensity. In particular, the reference velocity that's used in the definition can lead to some quite different results for the magnitude of the turbulence intensity. What I'm going to do in this talk is going to be addressing this confusion and showing you the different definitions of turbulence intensity so that in your CFD code, you can be clear about which definition is being used and which one you should be using to have the most effective presentation of your results. This talk is gonna clear up a lot of confusion and I know you're going to get a lot out of it. Right, let's get into the talk. So let's start things off with some physical understanding about what turbulence intensity actually represents. What I want you to do is think about a turbulent flow field uh, of any kind and if we place a probe in the turbulent flow field to measure the velocity, the velocity measurement over time will show fluctuations. And if we measure the different components of the velocity vector in the x, y and z coordinate directions for example, each of the velocity components will show different fluctuations and may show a different mean value. Now, after taking that velocity measurement with our probe, we could use various statistics to categorize the velocity fluctuations in each direction. We can take a time average, for example, we could take the standard deviation, we could take the root mean square. There are many different mathematical techniques that we could apply uh, to this transient time signal that we have for the different components of the velocity field. And because of all of these different statistical measurements that we could take of each of those velocity components and their fluctuations in the different directions, what we'd really like is we'd like a convenient method of describing the turbulence that just says to the reader or to the viewer how strong the turbulence is. We'd like a single metric that just crisply tells us in one number, do we have strong turbulence? Do we have medium turbulence or weak turbulence? And the reason this is good to have a single value is it's convenient and we can compare different applications. So for example, if we have a, a case with where we expect very low turbulence, we could just say, we expect this quantity to be low, or if we have a very turbulent flow field, we expect this quantity to be very high. Do we have a convenient metric? The convenient metric that we're looking for is the turbulence intensity. And the reason turbulence intensity is so convenient is because typical values have already been recorded and well documented for a range of different fluid flow applications. And if you look online, for example, for typical values of turbulence intensity, you may find, for example, that turbulence intensities in the range of zero to 1% are typically categorized as low. And this is what you might find, for example, in a in a, a towing tank or a wind tunnel in carefully controlled test conditions where we want to maintain low turbulence even though we're at a high Reynolds number. And for example, this could be useful for us for our CFD application because we might know if we're trying to recreate an experimental setup, the turbulence is probably going to be controlled and is going to be very low. And so we expect the value to be bet between zero and 1%. Likewise, for internal flow applications, we'd expect a turbulence in the range of perhaps one to 5%. So if you were designing, building, or testing uh, some internal flow scenario, for example, which didn't have particularly high turbulence, you'd expect the value to be in the range of one to 5%. And then higher values for very turbulent turbo machinery, coastal flows, for example. This is great. This is the concept we're looking for, giving us that single number that just in a single go categorizes roughly how strong the turbulence is. And how do we calculate it? If we think back to that example where we, we placed our point probe in a turbulent flow field of any kind, what we would do is we need the root mean square of the fluctuations in that measurement. So how do we do that? Well, quite simply, what we would do is start by taking the time average over a, a long period of our turbulent flow, and then we'd subtract that time average from the instantaneous velocity, and that would allow us to highlight the fluctuating velocity component about that time average for a long period. What we then do is square the instantaneous component, 
and then calculate the time average of that squared fluctuating component. And we do the same thing for each of the three velocity components. And then what we do is sum them together and take the square root. And that would give us the root mean square of the velocity fluctuations. That's the first thing that we do. We've taken those three signals that we've got for the three components of the velocity field and combined them together into a root mean square of those fluctuations. And then all we do is divide the root mean square by the time average, and this gives us a percentage. And this is actually the turbulence intensity. All the turbulence intensity is, quite directly, is it's the ratio of the root mean square of the fluctuations to the time average. And the way I like to think of this is in the small image you can see there in the slide, that the root mean square is that shaded area that's representing the fluctuations and roughly how large they are. And you're comparing the ratio of those fluctuations to the actual mean value. And you can see there that our root mean square, the shaded area, is about 0.1 meter per second, and our mean is two meters per second. So that means that the shaded area is 5% of the mean value. And that's turbulence intensity. It's that single number which is, it's sort of telling us how, how uh, significant those fluctuations are. Are they very large or are they very small? And this is giving us that single number that describes to us roughly how strong the turbulence is for measurements that we take in the flow field. But it's very important to note that we aren't considering the scales or the structure of the turbulence in any way or how it was generated. It's only, this is a single quantity that helps us if we're putting a point probe and we're just measuring fluctuations. That's all we would be doing. And of course we need to be quite careful with our definition here because if we were to place our point probe in a pipe flow, for example, or a flow that's predominantly in a single direction, we would still see fluctuations in all three velocity components. But of course, the mean of the, uh, of the components of velocity uh, normal to the axis, um, either in the y and z directions, as I've got them in the coordinate system here, would be zero. And for this reason, it's important that we use the velocity magnitude as our reference velocity and not the mean of that individual velocity component. Because of course, for UY, if we took our 5% and the 5% uh, and divided it by the zero mean value, that would be undefined. Whereas actually the more correct uh, value to take would be the two meters per second, which is the mean velocity magnitude there. So that's our definition of turbulence intensity. It's the ratio of the root mean square of all three components of the fluctuations relative to the velocity magnitude. So that's our physical understanding of turbulence intensity. How is turbulence intensity defined, used, and interpreted in RAND's CFD? Because for most of us, that's what we're going to be doing. Well, of course, when we're using a RAND CFD model, the majority of them, so K epsilon, K omega SST, we're not calculating and resolving that fluctuating velocity component. We don't even have a model that calculates an approximation of it. All we have in most cases is the turbulent kinetic energy, K. And this gives us some representation of what the velocity fluctuations are likely to be if we were to resolve that turbulent flow field either in LES or to have a full DNS simulation. It's giving us, turbulent kinetic energy is giving us some representation of what these fluctuating velocity components are. But there's some difficulties with turbulent kinetic energy, and you may have noticed this yourself when you're carrying out CFD simulations and trying to interpret what K physically represents. What I want you to do is think about a turbulent pipe flow, like the example you can see here on the slide. And let's say we had a turbulent kinetic energy of 2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters squared per second squared. The two main problems are what does this value physically mean? Is that value of K large or is it small? Is this a very turbulent flow field or is it relatively still? Is the turbulence very low? We don't know. The magnitude of the value is very difficult to interpret. This means that for specifying boundary conditions, if we have a new flow scenario where we haven't measured anything to do with the velocity field and we're designing a system and we want to know uh, the turbulence is going to be fairly strong coming through the system. What boundary conditions do I apply at my inlet to represent this turbulence? 
well, the value of k is quite difficult to interpret. What value should we apply? And what happens if we double the inlet velocity or change the geometry of the pipe? What if we make it uh, larger or smaller? How should this value of k change? What value should we apply? And how should we interpret changes in the predicted value of k? k is very difficult to interpret by itself. And the solution here, of course, is could we use turbulence intensity instead? Could we convert this value of k that we calculate from our CFD code, convert it into a turbulence intensity so we can interpret it ourselves and show it to other uh, stakeholders in our engineering project? It will be much easier for everyone to interpret a value of 5% turbulence intensity than a turbulent kinetic energy of 2 times 10 to the minus 3, for example. We could also use this to specify our boundary conditions because we saw earlier that values of turbulence intensity are quite well understood and documented. Indeed, for this internal flow application, we might expect the turbulence intensity coming in to be somewhere between 1% and 5%. And it would be great if we could convert that into a value of K that we can apply as a boundary condition. So how do we do this mathematically? Well, we start with the definition of turbulent kinetic energy, which you can see there in equation two. And now what you need to do is recall the definition of the root mean square of the velocity fluctuations, which is equation three. And we introduced that earlier in the talk. And you can see that those two equations are quite similar. And what of course you can do is combine them together and you will arrive at equation four, where the root mean square of the velocity fluctuations is equal to the square root of two thirds multiplied by the turbulent kinetic energy. This is a great result and it's gonna be very useful for us. Now what we can do is substitute in that two over three square root times the turbulent kinetic energy into the definition of the turbulence intensity that we have there in equation five. And with a small amount of rearranging, we arrive at equation six. And equation six is a key result. What it shows us is that if we have a value of turbulent kinetic energy, K, we can multiply it by two thirds and divide by the local velocity magnitude squared, take the square root, and that allows us to convert it into a turbulence intensity that's a lot easier for people to interpret. We may evaluate that, sum eight, that uh, equation and find that our turbulence intensity is 1%, which would tell us it's quite low. Or it might be evaluated and we might find it's 10% or 15%, which would tell us it's quite high. So instead of plotting contours of turbulent kinetic energy and line plots, we can plot uh, values of turbulence intensity instead, way easier to interpret. And we can also rearrange equation six to give us equation seven, which gives us a method of applying boundary conditions for K. If we have our inlet to our pipe flow as we had before, we expect a value I to be maybe 5%. We can substitute that in, multiply by our velocity magnitude, what we expect it to be, and that gives us a number for K that we can apply for our boundary conditions. So this is how I want you to think about it, is we can use that formula that we've derived to convert K into turbulence intensity, which is much easier for people to interpret. And you can see it here in the slide in this example contour plot. The contour plot on the left, I don't particularly know if a turbulence uh, kinetic energy of three times 10 to the minus three is big or small, but once we apply that formula and convert it into a turbulence intensity, I can really see where the turbulence intensity is low, around 1%, and where the turbulence intensity is high, let's say around 10%. So that's fantastic. That allows us to convert K into a number that's much easier for everyone to interpret. And of course, this is RAND CFD. So this is about the limit of the information that we get out of our RAND CFD. We know roughly how much energy is in the turbulence and what that represents. But of course, we don't know anything about the structure or the distribution of it. So now what I need to do is talk about one of the very important features of turbulence intensity that often causes uh, mistakes and misunderstanding and confusion, and that is the reference velocity. And if you look at equation eight, one of the things that many uh, CFD engineers often do is rather than using the velocity magnitude there on the bottom of the fraction, we use a reference velocity instead. So you can see that transformation in equation eight there. And the reason for this is sometimes it's more useful to use a fixed reference velocity 
for the definition of turbulence intensity that doesn't vary throughout the domain. Because in the analysis that we've done so far and in the definition, it's clear that the turbulence intensity depends on the local velocity magnitude at that particular location in the domain. But in some scenarios, it's more useful to have it not vary and actually just be taking at a fixed value, u ref, that's representative of the velocity throughout the domain. And I'm gonna think about this in a bit more detail and provide you with the understanding and the clarity that you need. The way I'm going to do this is with a simple example. I want you to think about this internal flow scenario where we have a domain with a complex shape where the velocity is going to vary considerably throughout the domain. We may have some areas of flow separation, we may have some recirculation regions, and we may have some regions where the flow is fairly planar and well-defined. This is fairly typical of many applications. Now, in the first scenario, I want you to think about, we've carried out a CFD simulation, we've got a solution for the velocity field and the turbulent kinetic energy throughout the domain, and we want to either interpret this ourselves or present it to an advisor or as part of our thesis document or report. And if we use the definition of turbulence intensity where the reference velocity is fixed, this allows us to interpret the contours of turbulent intensity as a representation of the velocity fluctuations. Now, don't worry if that seems a little bit confusing at first, I'm now gonna step through it in a bit more detail. The first thing I want you to do is look a little bit at the equation in the box there that I've got for you. All I've done is rearrange the definition of turbulence intensity, which is normally the root mean square divided by the, the uh, velocity magnitude. I've just rearranged it in terms of the root mean square of the velocity fluctuations and use the fixed reference velocity, because that's what we're doing here. If we plot contours of turbulence intensity where the turbulence intensity is defined with that fixed velocity, then what we can do is we can read directly off the plot what the, ref what the velocity fluctuations are likely to be. So for example, in this case, if we use a fixed reference velocity of two meters per second, I can now look at the contour and see that at the inlet, the turbulence intensity is 5%. So if I multiply 5% by the reference velocity, that's telling me that the root mean square of the velocity fluctuations is likely to be 0.1 meters per second. So if I place a probe in the flow there, the CFD simulation is telling me that the root mean square of the velocity fluctuations there is likely to be around 0.1 meters per second. And because the reference velocity is fixed throughout the domain, I can now look at the map that the contour provides me with, and everywhere in the domain I can see, ah, the turbulence intensity at that point is 10%. That tells me that if I put a probe there, the velocity fluctuations are likely to be 0.2 meters per second. And this is really useful if you're uh, either looking at or planning some kind of uh, experimental procedure, or you want to know actually what the velocity fluctuations are likely to be within the limitations, of course, of the RAND solver, because the RAND solver doesn't resolve the turbulence, and so you won't get any of that detail. Now, if we contrast that to the other case where we did the same thing again, we took our CFD simulation results and we plotted the turbulence intensity, but this time we based it on a definition of a velocity magnitude taken as the local velocity, what that's going to tell us is it's actually going to tell us the strength, the local strength of the turbulence, which we could then compare to other applications. So for example, if you, took, if you take that point in the recirculation zone where the flow is likely to be driven around in a sort of the format of a lid driven cavity, the turbulence intensity based on a fixed reference velocity might say that the turbulence intensity is 10%. But actually we know there that the flow is gonna be moving fairly slowly, so the local velocity magnitude is actually a lot lower. And relative to the local velocity magnitude, the turbulence intensity is actually 22%. And that's a better representation of the nature of the turbulence at that location. It's actually very strong, 22%, a very locally strong turbulent uh, flow field which is much stronger than the 10%, which the other definition would have imp implied. 
So what I wanted to do on this slide is to really summarize the two approaches so that you can have them clear in your mind about what the two approaches are and which one you should pick if you need to pick. Now, when you're presenting your CFD results, if you'd like to provide an indication of what the local velocity fluctuations are like, likely to be, then using a constant reference velocity is more useful because equation nine there, you can directly use the value of the turbulence intensity in your contour plot, multiply it by that fixed reference velocity, and it's just giving you a direct reflection of what the velocity fluctuations are likely to be. Now, on the other hand, if you want to compare the strength of your turbulence locally with other applications, then you could instead plot the turbulence intensity based on the local velocity magnitude instead, and that's equation 10 there. And of course, it's also worth me saying that you don't Sometimes you don't need to choose and you can actually do both. And actually in many scenarios, it's worthwhile using both approaches, comparing and pulling out the detail from both of them that's most useful. So what does this mean for you as a user? That's really what I want to uh, talk a little bit more about now. The first thing that the implications of this talk tell us is that it's essential when you present contours of turbulence intensity to note either in the caption or in the text what definition of turbulence intensity has been used because quite clearly the contours are going to be very different depending on if you've used the local velocity or a fixed reference velocity. And if you think of a case like a simple pipe flow, for example, the local velocity is very low, close to the wall, it's actually going to tend to zero. And so because that velocity is getting very, very small, the turbulence intensity could be very high if it's based on that local velocity. Whereas if it's fixed, the turbulence intensity may not be. So what you need to do is make it absolutely clear when you're presenting turbulence intensity in whatever form, what your reference velocity is. Of course, if it's a fixed value, you should state what that is. And the second implication of this talk as well is that if you're using values of turbulence intensity directly out of your CFD code, you need to check what velocity the CFD code is actually using to compute the turbulence intensity. And just to give you an example, if you're a fluent user, for example, and you use the turbulence intensity that's available to you in the fluent post processor, that turbulence intensity is based on the reference velocity that's in the table that you fill in. So this, of course, is a fixed reference velocity. So you need to make sure you're clear about which one the CFD code is using. And actually a convenient way around this, if you're not clear what value your CFD code is doing, is to just create your own turbulence intensity fields in the post processor. Often there's a calculator function or some functionality that allows you to define your own fields. And you can define two different turbulence intensity fields, one based on a local velocity and one based on a fixed velocity so that you have direct control over what your turbulence intensity actually means. And the final thing I want to talk about briefly are velocity inlets, because this is something that frequently people find difficulty with or they get confused when they're trying to specify a velocity inlet. Of course, for a turbulent flow field, um, if we have a typical incompressible flow scenario where we have a single inlet and a single outlet, and we've got a velocity inlet where we specify a velocity, temperature, and we need to specify values of turbulent kinetic energy, and turbulent dissipation rate if we're using a RAN solver such as and a model such as the K epsilon or K omega SST models, we need to specify K. And at velocity inlets, the turbulence intensity is going to be calculated from the local velocity and not the fixed reference velocity. The reason this is important, of course, is that if we know we have a pipe flow, for example, and the turbulence intensity is likely to be 5% at the inlet, and we're specifying a parabolic velocity profile where the velocity is low at the wall and then high at the middle, this will of course mean that the turbulent kinetic energy also then forms a profile because where the velocity is low, the turbulence intensity multiplied by a small value will give a small number. And for open foam, for example, you can look directly in the source code to check this, and you can see there, just in the section of the code that I've pulled out, that the turbulent kinetic energy K is clearly being calculated from three over two times the turbulence intensity that the user specifies squared, multiplied 
by the velocity magnitude at the self centroid squared as well. But there's one thing that's very important to bear in mind with these inlets where you're specifying the turbulent kinetic energy. And that of course is for internal flows, we're going to get boundary layer growth. So if we have an inlet and we have walls, then even if we specify a parabolic velocity profile, this velocity profile might not be fully numerically consistent. And so as soon as the flow enters the domain, a boundary layer is going to be developing and growing from the walls and the boundary layer acts as a source of turbulent kinetic energy. Of course, what will happen is that this growth of the boundary layer and the generation of turbulent kinetic energy will quickly mask the value that we specify at the inlet. And this can be quite a tricky scenario because of course the boundary layer is going to be masking the value at the inlet and you're going to get a mix of the two. What do you actually need to do? Well, of course, the there are two approaches of course the best way to do this is if you can extend the length of your domain to allow this boundary layer to fully uh, reach the center line of the channel so that you have fully developed profiles entering your actual domain that you care about that's one way to do it or to run this as a separate simulation and work out what the fully developed profiles of u k epsilon and your other variables are and then applying those profiles at the inlet that's gonna give you a far more accurate approach than if you just specify a profile based on the turbulence intensity. So that's one small side point. I hope that's made sense and you can think about your own CFD simulations, how you're actually going to apply uh, inlet boundary conditions for K if you have those, but definitely this um, formula is going to be a fairly good approximation if you don't have anything else that's available to you. So just to finish off with a quick summary of what I talked about today, as a reminder, the turbulence intensity physically is a ratio of the root mean square of the velocity fluctuations to the time average velocity magnitude at a point in a turbulent flow field. And this uh, definition is useful because it allows us to interpret turbulent kinetic energy and the strength of turbulence in flow fields, but it doesn't tell us anything about the structure or the distribution of turbulent kinetic energy among scales of turbulence. And in the definition, we can either as engineers take the reference velocity as a constant value or use the local velocity. And it's really important, regardless of what you're doing, that you're clear of which of those definitions that you're using so that you can interpret it properly and that you report that alongside your turbulence intensity results so that the readers can also understand the values that you're presenting and interpret them well. So that wraps up my discussion of turbulence intensity. Let me know in the comments section, did you find this talk useful? And do you have a good understanding of the differences between using a fixed reference velocity and a reference velocity equal to the local velocity magnitude for the definition of turbulence intensity? Let me know in the comments section and also let me know if you have any further questions and I'll see if I can answer those. Finally, I just want to wrap up the talk by saying thank you very much for all of you for continuing to support the channel. I do really appreciate it and it means a lot to me. And I'll see you in the next video.